This I am Rakesh Chada. I work as a data scientist for X.AI. We build AI assistants named Amy Ingram and Andrew Ingram that schedules meetings for each one of us. So just to give some perspective, like we have around 90 million knowledge workers in the US, and we should, per year we schedule about 10 billion meetings. So by building Amy and Andrew, we aim to use, we aim to get the customers use both of them to schedule each of those 10 billion meetings. So that said, let's get started with the talk. So in this talk, we will see how Amy, our assistant, understands humans. So let me start with a quick outline. So these are the different kind of topics uh, that I will cover in the talk. First, we will see a bit of introduction to Amy. And then we will walk through a bit of high-level product architecture of ours. And then we will see some of the challenges that's associated with understanding natural language. And then we will see how our data science models evolved over time. And then we will have some interesting comparisons between non-deep learning and deep learning approaches that we used. And finally, we'll summarize with some sort of some takeaways that we have from the talk. So let's get started with the introduction to our product, Amy. So imagine a quite, quite a typical scenario when a meeting scheduling where two people are trying to meet with each other. So in this case, one of them happens to be me and the other one, my co-founder, Marcos. So Marcos starts by emailing me asking, hey, Rakesh, can we do a walkthrough of your presentation when you have time? And then I respond saying, sure, how about tomorrow afternoon? But uh, Marcos happens to be busy at that time and asks, suggests a different time, how about Wednesday morning? And unfortunately, I happen to have back-to-back -back meetings Wednesday morning and say, how about afternoon? So there's a bit of back and forth that happens, and finally we settle on a time, which is Wednesday afternoon, and we end up meeting. But if you actually look at it, it's, it's a quite a bit of pain to go through just to schedule a meeting. So this is where Amy comes in. Uh, the task of this back and forth is handled by Amy. So let's see how this same scenario changes once we have Amy in picture. So now again, Marcos, in the same meeting, like sends me the email saying, can we meet? Instead of talking and coordinating with Marcos, I will now CC in Amy, uh, saying like, uh, hey, Marcos, can you coordinate with Amy and get the meeting scheduled? So, and then like, uh, after some back and forth, I directly have the calendar in my, right in my inbox, uh, without having to go through any of this uh, painful coordination. So, and also we have this very ideal scenario in which there's completely zero back and forth, and then there's an invite that appears magically in your inbox, and we call it like scheduling nirvana. And that happens when both Marrakesh and Marcos, like both of the participants in the email, uh, in the meeting, like happen to have subscribed to Amy. And which is the ideal scenario we are really looking for as and when we scale the company. So that concludes the introduction, a brief introduction, and then let's move on to see how our architecture uh, the evolved over time. So there are two major components one of them is the NLU part, which is the natural language understanding. And the second one is the natural language generation, NLG part. So I will now, through an example, go through each of these subcomponents and explain uh, what goes on inside them. So this is the example that I'm gonna use. So again, we have the email that says, Amy, can you please find a time for us to meet for 45 minutes in my office next week? And some constraints after Monday, please. So, Let's see what happens inside of a pre-processing. So this step involves uh, dividing the email into multiple parts. So something like, for instance, in the same email, we have salutation. And we have the body, which is the actual content of the email. And then we have the signature of the email. So this step involves like parsing the email into these multiple parts. And moving on to the next component, which is entity extraction. This involves identifying uh, all the named ent entities in a text. So an entity is any real world object such as uh, in, the in the context of a meeting, a person, a time, location, etc. So in the same example, like uh, we see that uh, there are multiple entities. So for instance, 45 minutes, it's a duration that we need to uh, identify. And my office is the location. And the next week is the time that we want to identify. And there's a constraint saying after Monday. So this step involves extracting all such entities. And it's, the task here is not to just detect uh, the entities, but rather resolve them. So for instance, what does my office exactly mean? It needs to map to the exact physical location on the map. So this sort of detection plus the resolution goes on inside the entity extraction. And the next major component is this intent classification. 
this involves understanding what an email is suggesting in terms of meeting scheduling actions. So in the same example, again, like what we should ideally identify is that uh, Marcos is intending Amy to schedule a new meeting. So this needs to be inferred from the phrases such as, can you please find a time? And with the, with what exactly to uh, specify as a time constraint? So in this case, it's the next week. So this part of the pipeline involves understanding what an user is indicating in terms of meeting scheduling actions. So the next big component we have is this natural language generation component. This can be thought of broadly divided into two categories. The first one is uh, something we call dialogue manager. This is a very common component in any dialogue system. The responsibility of the dialogue manager is to take all the inputs from the NLU component and process the information and uh, use the response generator to generate the final response that gets sent out, sent out to the customers. So the interplay of this dialogue manager and the response generator is what belongs in a composer. And for the email that we are looking, uh, through, look, looking through till now, like this is the response that Amy sends out as a, uh, in, re in reply to the constraints that we have. We have, the Amy says, it's very human-like if you look at the actual email. It's like, uh, happy to get something on Marco's calendar. Does Wednesday at this time work? Alternatively, he's available like uh, some extra times. And it mentions where the Marcos office location is, so that like meeting can happen at the particular location. So this is a rough idea of what belongs in our architecture. Let's now look on at uh, some of the challenges in understanding natural language in the context of meeting scheduling that we face. So for one, like for, uh, it, this is a very general NLU problem. Like to express the same intent, people have different forms of uh, expressing them. So for instance, imagine like uh, an email expressing time. So this could, this could be something like 1 slash 21, meaning like it could be inferred as 21st of January. And then it could be something like July apostrophe 18, meaning it should be inferred as July 2018. And people could mention something like weekend that should be resolved to something like a Saturday and Sunday. They could mention lunch as sort of inferring time. So, and they could mention duration like a couple of days. So there are like extremely uh, like wide variations in the ways people express just the time itself. So, and along with them, people also have some, uh, in the emails, the constraints like, can you schedule after the weekend? So imagine like the algorithm that's processing the text end up not determining the word after and just schedule it on the weekend. It's a very poor user experience and we, we would want to ideally avoid that. So the model that's algorithm that's classifying this has to learn uh, the exact complete representation of the time uh, within the context of meeting scheduling. And the second challenge we see is, uh, again, applies to any NLU problem, which is the context completely changes of the meaning of what an entity should represent. So for, to understand this in detail, let's pick two examples. Uh, in the first one, which says, Amy, can you schedule a meeting for late afternoon? And in the second email, we have, Amy, I will be late to the meeting. So if you look at the word late, it has completely two different meanings in both of those emails. So if you have some sort of a dumb algorithm that classifies a word just by looking at the word itself and trying to infer meaning, then that would fail in this uh, scenario because it, does, it has no idea of what the context is. So and then next challenge is something we consider as a quite complex, which is the entity resolution. So just to define what an entity resolution is, so it's taking any time mentioned on the text and converting it to a structured representation. So to understand this, like let's look at this example, which says schedule a meeting in the morning at 10 a.m. next week, Monday to Wednesday. So let's try to break it down, like actually what exactly is the time. So first of all, it says it's in the morning. And second, it says at 10 a.m. And there's one more constraint on the top of it, which says it's next week. And even it's like ill-specified, week is specified as WK. And, and for that, we have something like Monday hyphen Wednesday. Those needs to be resolved as Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So like imagine like, the, this step involves basically taking all that text and building a structured representation out of it by understanding uh, several subparts in it. So this is actually quite a complex problem, and we built a sophisticated parser that could uh, do this at a very high accuracy. So and next, moving on to the next challenge, we have something called the identifying relevance to a meeting scheduling context. So imagine an email that says, I just got from, uh, response to, as a response to Amy, like says, I just got back from San Francisco yesterday. So this could mean two different things depending on how the meeting is progressed uh, till that phase. So imagine the meeting is actually happening at San Francisco. Uh, 
then this is something that's conveying a positive intent, saying like, yes, I will be in San Francisco so we can meet. And whereas like the, if the meeting is happening at a location that's not San Francisco, then this is kind of conveying a negative intent, saying like I will be at a different place so I can't meet at San Francisco. So, so just identifying the San Francisco as itself doesn't not sufficient. We have to kind of maintain the state of the state of dialogue to understand what an entity exactly represents. So next. Uh, which is something which we say like occasionally, which we get usually, we usually get emails which are like large bodies of text and with only one or two lines representing any information that's related to the meeting scheduling. So the algorithm that's processing it has to learn to ignore all the non-relevant meeting scheduling information and only capture its attention towards the meeting related ones. And finally, we have uh, something we call composition challenges. This step involves like uh, looking at multiple pieces of the text and then aggregating information from different places into one. So imagine, take this example, which says next week works. I am busy this week though. We can try Tuesday. So the challenge here is to like, which, which of the next week and this week's Tuesday the user is really referring to? Is it this week Tuesday or next week Tuesday? So those sort of like aggregating information from different parts. So and next we have the general ambiguity in expressing intents. So as, we, as, we, as I just said, like if the meeting is not happening at the place that the user mentioned, it can refer to a completely different thing. And as a final thing, like if you remember from the architecture, we have like this major two boxes, the entity extraction and the intent classification. There are some sort of problems that kind of fall in neither of those uh, boxes. One, something like a relationship classification. So let's take this example, which says, Amy, please work with John, James assistant, to get a meeting scheduled. So here, if you identify just that someone is assisting someone, like it's not sufficient. It's the direction of the relationship matters. We have to know that like James, John is assisting James and not the vice versa. So those sort of relationship determination like uh, challenges exist as a common problem in the meeting scheduling. So that concludes some of the challenges that we face in like day to day with the understanding natural language. So let's now move on to the next section which is understanding how our models that solve some of these problems evolved over time. So when we started, like we started using this rule-based approaches, which are pretty simple. You have a bunch of conditions, if else conditions you can think of, saying like if this condition is satisfied, uh, do this particular action and so on. So it's very ad hoc rules-based approach. And then we started using outputs directly by calling the libraries of third parties. So this, when I say so some examples, uh, we have Stanford uh, exp uh, exposing some very cool uh, NLP for NLP libraries. And we also have stuff like NLTK in Python that has handy NLP functions. So we just use the outputs uh, of those functions and then uh, to classify stuff. <coughs> and then as our data started to grow in size, we started training our own models uh, within the data, using the data that we collected over time. So, I kind of divide this section into this non-deep learning, uh, all the traditional machine learning algorithms, uh, support vector machines, logistic regressions, et cetera. And then as our data started to grow in like bigger scale, we started uh, moving our, uh, converting each of the models to a deep learning based system. So uh, with that are completely trained in-house using our own data set. So we will understand this evolution a bit more when we look at a case study. And the case study that we'll be seeing is that identifying time detection. We have looked at it in the architecture. So this involves extracting which expressions in the text represent time. So we started with, again, using regular expressions. For those who are not familiar, these are sort of pattern matching techniques on the text that you can use to identify times. And then we moved on to using libraries uh, like from Stanford. There is this particularly very handy library called SUTime, which, which is specifically built for this task time detection. So that said, the one of the challenges that we constantly see and that applies to not just time detection but even to other problems is that like when you start using these third party uh, library outputs, you kind of hit a performance uh, peak, you can say, and then you can't really improve your performance beyond that particular limit because you are constrained by using the outputs of the third party libraries. So, but like in, that's what like led us to our next model which is using conditional random fields. So 
I won't go into details of explaining how the conditional random field works, but it's a probabilistic graphical model. Uh, there are a lot of online resources that can be used to like learn more about it. So we use this uh, custom built conditional random fields architectures, something like skip chain CRFs. Uh, and then we use the library from factory, which is, which is coming from University of Mass, uh, Massachusetts Amherst. So we use the factory library to build CRF models to do the time detection task. And then it's really effective in handling any temporal dependencies. And finally, for the deep learning approaches, we used very interestingly the convolutional neural networks for the case of time detection, and they proved to be very effective. Um, like the, I will go into the details of explaining how convolutional neural, neural networks works for the case of time detection. So we will see how it's actually outperformed the previous models. <coughs> so this architecture of ours is based on this very seminal paper called Natural Language Processing, almost from scratch. It's a great paper from Colobert and Jason Weston. So the, we used a variant of this architecture and like tweaked it to suit our, tweaked it to suit our time detection task. And then we were able to reduce like phenomenal results even with zero feature engineering. So uh, if you're not familiar, feature engineering is sort of handcrafting, manually handcrafting tons of features to be able to classify a particular task at hand. And if you look at the previous model, the conditional random fields, that involved a ton of feature engineering that has to go in uh, to build, the, to be able to classify. Whereas for the convolutional neural networks, even with zero feature engineering, we are able to outperform the previous model uh, by a good margin. So this approach of ours is based on something called context window. So just to see what a context window is, so imagine you have this text that says 2 p.m. works for me. And the context window for the word for of size three is something like one word uh, right to a, one word right to the word for and one word left to the word for. So you're kind of capturing a local context for each of the word within a window. And for instance, for the word for, we have the works for me as a uh, embedded inside a single window. So this is roughly how our CNN architecture looks like. So for as a first step, we take the text and process it into a list of tokens. And for each token, we use this uh, compressed n-dimensional representation, which is a very standard in NLP tasks called word embeddings. Uh, and once we have tokens convert, converted to the embeddings, we then have a context windows operating over each of those embeddings. And now like over each of those context windows, we do convolution and a max pooling. Again, these are very standard operations in a, any deep learning convolution uh, neural network based approach. And then at the end, we have this softmax layer that takes the predictions and then that outputs the prediction probabilities for each of the classes that we have. So <laughs> that's about it for the CNN's architecture. Before I move on to the next section, I would like to quickly show a cool visualization that uh, one of our data scientists, Adam, built. Uh, before we go into the understanding what this is, like just to give some context. So this is a visualization produced by using this algorithm called TSNE. It's a standard uh, visualization technique to, uh, for the word embeddings. So the task here at hand is basically to train a language model. The language model basically, the goal is to predict the next word given the current state of words that it has seen. So it's like a unsupervised technique. You just have to, uh, given the all set of emails, you have to predict next word. And then if you, if you visualize the representation that you obtained on such a task, which is unsupervised, so you see this nice uh, word clusters uh, uh, that are nicely categorized in this one plot. So it's hard to read what it is. I will go and zoom into specific sections of the plot. So let's try to zoom in into this orange plot that you see, uh, orange cluster that you see. So this is what it represents. So you see like all the named, named entities like persons aggregated nicely in one place. So for instance, you see Amy, Andrew, Patrick, Jason, Adam, and nicely aggregated in one place. And if you move on to a different section, you see like all the locations aggregated. Like you see uh, San Francisco, you see New York, you see Detroit, uh, cities and like nicely aggregated in one place. And again, if you move on to a different place, you see meeting active activities being aggregated. You see Skype, lunch, breakfast, coffee. So without providing any supervised signal, the model was able to learn and cluster into different categories. So that's quite an interesting discovery once we, we had, like once we have plotted the visualization. <coughs> so <coughs> that 
That concludes uh, the evaluation of our data science model section. Let us now move on to understand some of the interesting comparisons we have for non-deep learning and deep learning approaches. So the case study that we will look at here is the intent classification. So just to give a brief uh, or refresher of the what an intents represent, we have two broad categories of intents. One of them we call email intents. So things like Amy, can you cancel this meeting? Where the intent is to identify that the current meeting that's ongoing needs to be canceled and no more scheduling actions needs to be taken. And we have something called entity intents, which are completely different from the email intents. So they are tied to a specific entity. So for instance, look at this email that says Wednesday at 2 p.m. works, but 5 p.m. Uh, Wednesday at 2 p.m. does not work, but 5 p.m. works. So there the intent that's associated attached to the word Wednesday at, or the phrase Wednesday at 2 p.m. is a negative one and intent that's attached to the phrase 5 p.m. is a positive one. So there is no single intent that's lying at the email, but it's more localized to a specific entity. So this involves like identifying such entity specific intents. So now we will see like what uh, algorithms we used in the non-deep learning and deep learning approaches for the email intent classification. So for the case of non-deep learning approaches, so we, the features that we typically use are some sort of n-grams. n-grams are a consecutive n tokens that you pick from the text and any non-textual features that you can use related to the meetings ap apart from any text that you have. So one of the very interesting architectures we have is this classifier chain ensemble approach. It is for the multi-label classification. It's based off a research work by Reed et al. So actually our implementation of this approach is just got open source to scikit-learn library. So I had included a link uh, where you can actually go and get the code for it. It's pretty cool multi-label classification approach. So and, so and then we used all the standard uh, as support vector machines, random forest, lo logistic regression, et cetera. And they happen to perform quite well for this email intent classification task. So XGBoost, like which happens to perform very well on any sort of machine learning co contest that you see at Kaggle, et cetera, also proved effective for this uh, email intent classification. And for the case of deep learning approaches, so we tried the variants uh, which are standard like long short term memory networks and gated recurrent units. And then we use the word embeddings that you saw before uh, in that word plot, nice word plot that we had. So the word embeddings that were learned in that particular task are used to do the intent classification here. And then we used the architectures which are LSTMs and JRUs. And along with that, we had some context features that are not uh, specific to a text. And a very interesting observation that we had, uh, it has to be taken with a bit of grain of salt, but what we, I saw it was that a deep learning approach weren't really like outperforming any of the non-deep learning approaches. So again, there could be n reasons for this. It could be a case that we haven't have enough data to actually leverage the power of deep learning, et cetera. But it's just the observation that we had uh, for the case of this specific task of email intent classification. So and moving on to the next task, which is the entity intent classification, we will again see a comparison between the non-deep learning and deep learning approaches. So for the non-deep learning, again, we have the standard n-gram features, but this time instead of operating on the whole text, you operate on this context windows, which we, which we saw before. It captures the neighborhood of a specific token. And again, you feed them through standard machine learning techniques like SVM random forest. And uh, these models happen to give a reasonable performance. Let's now see like how deep learning counterparts like performed on this specific task. So uh, we, the, the architecture we have is a quite interesting and novel architecture. I will like jump into the details quite soon. But it's a bidirectional LSTM and GRU, uh, which, 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 which we use to classify the entity level intents. Uh, for the, and then what we observed here is kind of different from what we observed at the email intent classification, which is the deep learning happened to prove like much more effective than the non-deep learning counterparts. So we will now look at a, like in detail what exactly the architecture looks like for this specific task of entity intent classification. So now let's, let's say we have this uh, sentence that says 2 p.m. works, but 4 p.m. does not. So this tokens, each of these tokens in this sentence is fed to this embeddings layer, which, which we saw before. You get a compressed n-dimensional representation of a text, of a token. And then you have sort of this two layers, forward layer and backward layer, that operate in text in two directions. One of them operates in the forward direction, and one of them operate, reads the text in backwards. So the idea here is to kind of 
uh, the intuition behind this is to it uh, the model captures the context for a specific token in both directions and that could be very, very effective for a task like entity intent classification where a meaning of entity could change uh, depending on the text that comes after or that comes before so now once you have like both of these representations from the forward and backward directions you kind of concatenate into one single uh, representation in this representation layer and that once you have the final representation for a token you feed that through a softmax that gives you the probabilities for each of the classes that you have so for instance for the word like uh, 2pm you see that you have a uh, ideally you would have a classifier that would tell you it's a more probable that it's a positive time uh, which is a positive time mention and for the 4pm it should tell that it's a time that doesn't work for the specific case at hand so that sort of summarizes the architecture we have for the entity intent classification so that's uh, that's a, that's pretty much it for the non deep learning and deep learning comparison let's now like look at some of the things that we when i say we we as a company learned through our course of time as we evolved and then which we think are applicable to any sort of general audience too so first is sort of a very general and vague advice but it's kind of often ignored is it's really helps to analyze the problem like extremely well beforehand before we start to jump on to any fancier solutions so based on a specific problem type like it's possible that one solution might be more effective than the another so for instance we just saw this in the case of email versus entity classification so for the email intent approach for our context like the deep learning happened to not outperform its non deep learning counterparts and whereas the case was opposite for the entity intent classification so we have to really try different approaches before we sort of uh, invest a lot of time in one specific task and second is the thing that we believe applies to any general supervised setting so it's really important to analyze a model's performance uh, as a function of number of labeled data points and i will get to this like why this is important this is something we call like learning curve learning curves so let's look at one such uh, learning curve from a uh, completely like independent task this is sentiment sentiment analysis so i used a very uh, recent model called sentiment neuron for this it's a really cool paper uh that basically it tells you can classify the sentiment pretty much using one neuron so I, i have the reference for it if you want to look at the details of it further so if you look at the learning curve here you see that uh the performance if you look at the performance change as and when you scale the number of data points you see that there's not quite a bit of change in the performance as and when you uh scale the data set from say let's say 10 points to like 10 uh 100000 data points so like even by providing 10 data points like we are able to achieve the accuracy of around 93% and like even after scaling the 10 data points to 100000 data points the accuracy only changed from 93 to 93 odd to like 94 odd so imagine like every data annotation every label annotation that you are having like comes at a cost so you should really uh, evaluate the trade off between the cost that you are investing and the performance gains that you are obtaining for the are labeling the data so doing this sort of analysis beforehand gives us that insight of okay how much data do i really need for this specific task task at hand so before before we go on blindly like get lot of annotations <coughs> uh so let's move on to the next slide ha huh, and this this is sort of the last thing but i believe this is one of the most important things to keep in mind which is like when designing a system we should really invest at least as much time in the designing metrics part of it uh, as we spend in designing the training algorithms so like just to see why this is again uh, imagine we have a poor model so it might not look like poor at all like it might look even looking fantastic fantastically fantastically well like if you don't have a good metric system to evaluate it so whereas ironically if you have a extremely well performing model but if you are not able to actually accurately assess that performance it doesn't make sense to have that model in place because you kind of end up throwing away that model because you had a bad way of evaluating the model so it's it's first like really important to spend a time like making sure the metric system you have is robust before we spend a ton of research into building the new models and as a second as a final tidbit like it's it's important to also think metrics not in terms of the actual performance numbers for the model too but also in terms of like how much the model is having impact for the product uh, 
So imagine like if I were to completely thinking independent of the product, and I will optimize for uh, its performance on a single class, and we like kind of made some decisions that made that made us like deploy the model, but uh, the deploy a less suboptimal model because we happen to kind of uh, overfit our model to that specific class performance. And now we go to the product and we realize that that class happens one in like one million times. So the entire like uh, brute force optimization we did for the specific class happens to not have as much impact for the product. So whereas we could have, if you had known that before, we could have not really optimized the model for that specific class and kind of make it classify on the remaining ones and with a much more higher impact on the product. So that kind of summarizes my talk and I would first like to thank my company, X.A. for providing me this opportunity and also the Oriel staff uh, for providing me this great opportunity to speak in front of you, and thanks for being here. And feel free to ask me any questions right now, or like I'll shoot me an email uh, later if you have. So that's it. Thank you. So you're saying uh, when Amy doesn't quite understand? Uh -huh. You know, my, my boss sure. writes in unintelligible emails uh -huh. to me. So if Amy couldn't figure out what he was saying, would Amy then kick it back to him? Would it Amy send it to me? Or yes. would you take it and look at it and figure out and sort of override Amy with a real human to try to resolve it? No, it, yeah, it, it gets sent back to the customer, like, who's actually using it. It says, like, I'm sorry, I'm not able to understand, so... Uh, maybe you can coordinate with the other person too. So that happens. Uh, yeah, I guess that's pretty much. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, what percent? Uh, uh, what percent of the interactions are handled by humans in your system, and how has that changed over time? So for that part, like the on the you see that you remember that like we have two components, right? NLU and NLG. For the NLG part, like it's completely automated. But for the, there are some tasks in NLU that gets handled by humans, like uh, we use humans to verify the annotations. Mm, but yeah, that's, I can't reveal the actual fractions of how much uh, percentage it is, but there are some fraction of the NLU that's being handled by humans. But not the generation part, yeah. Yes, uh, unfortunately, I can't go into what metrics you use. Uh, that's an IP. But yeah, I mean, it's, I would say like we should really keep in mind like the, we can't be thinking of metrics as a standard thing that you use to evaluate everything, but rather you have to think of what task you're trying to solve and like customize in that specific scenario. Yeah. Are you able to share how much training data was required? How much labeled data you needed to get to a point where she was really understanding? Uh, that's again uh, completely depend uh, depends on the task. So if you remember the one of the last plots, that's I mean it's not in the meeting scheduling, but that's one case of sentiment classification where like even 10 points, 10 data points were sufficient. So uh, I would say for the answer to that question, it's completely specific to a task that you are looking at, whether it's a detection or intent classification or anything. Yep. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, are you referring to the final, this by LSTM approach? Uh, uh, this one? Yeah, you had two different You had one that said, I want to delete this message, and the other one said, I want, to, I, want, I want to follow up on the message with two different classifiers when you're getting the same message. How, what happens if you have both the same message? How do you handle collisions? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by collisions, though, but like usually for a, for a given task, there's only one classifier at hand. Like you, you won't have two classifiers performing the same thing. Yeah. What is the main theory of development going forward? Sorry, can you combine? Uh, what, is, what, are, what are the areas of development that you are focusing on going forward? So, yeah, I would say our focus right now is on like some of the tasks that require human verification on the NLU. Ideally, we would eventually want to be scaled to automate as much as possible. Uh, if possible, 
So, so I would say like basically scaling the automation fraction we have to as much as possible. And of course, making sure that quality remains consistent as and when you automate. Yeah, I would say definitely. Like, if if we want, even not not just for chatbots for anything, we should. If there is some solution around that's like if solving the task at hand, we should definitely use it rather than trying to invest a lot of time building our own. Unless there is some specific need that that particular external solution doesn't satisfy. Yep. So, how many people would you use it? Like how many customers do you have? And how many people use it? Uh, I don't know if I can. I'm not sure if I can level it, but we can talk later. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah, since I'm the, using the Sure. And then the, what if actually can be uh, many different users using the same Amy? Actually, which Amy is Amy? How do you know about it? That's, I mean, that's actually the ideal scenario, right? Which we call scheduling Nirvana. It's, you don't really have to, the kind of ping pong is almost eliminated there. And it's more like a constraint satisfaction problem now, like where we have to find a time that matches for all the participants that has Amy and send an invite for the time and location, yeah. Second question is, yeah. do you have any future plan for the different language NLP? Yes, that's definitely on the roadmap to, like once we solve for the English, we'll definitely move on to other languages. But we'll definitely want to solve in English first. And any more? Cool. In that case, like, feel free to, like, uh, get me, reach me or reach to me later too. Thank you.